Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. It's almost the weekend, it's almost the 4th of July. I'm excited. Uh, this video is going to be the second half of the Roman Empire. Well, really the second half of Rome, meaning the Roman Empire. And we're going to start with Augustus Caesar. That's where we left off last time. So real quick, Augustus is actually the adopted son of Julius Caesar, and his original name was Octavian. Uh, he takes the name Augustus uh, a little bit later. But in 31 BC, Octavian, he's going to end the civil wars that had been going on in Rome for the past 30-something years. And his first task, once he wins, is to restore the government. And he kind of does this, but kind of not. He does try to recreate the Republic. He gives the Senate a position. He recreates a Senate, if you will. But he doesn't actually give the Senate enough power to do anything. Uh, so there is a Senate, but eh, they're kind of useless in some ways. Uh, another thing he's going to do is he's going to name himself the first citizen of the state, or in in Latin, it's the princeps civitatis. So princeps civitatis, first citizen of the state. Now that alone didn't give him any extra power, but he gives himself all sorts of titles. He declares himself the consul. He calls himself the tri uh, tribunica potesta, which basically gives him all the power of the tribunes. He can go directly to the people with legislation and laws, and he can call the Senate into session whenever he wants to. He calls himself the Pontifex Maximus. He's the chief religious official. He is the head priest, if you will. And he says he's the imperator, the head of the Roman army. When you put all four of those titles together, Augustus is the first emperor in history. Now, one of the most important things that he does is he changes the way the army works. He makes it this permanent professional fighting force. Uh, the soldiers receive regular training. The training is standardized. There are career officers who advance in rank according to their experience and their length of service. And the legions are transferred from place to place as needed. It's more like today's military. Uh, the military is going to be used for defense. Um, it's going to be actually made smaller because he's going to send off soldiers to service colonists in all the land that's conquered. And when those soldiers go, they take the language, the culture, all the ideas, the religion, and Rome explodes. Another thing that he does is he creates this idea of provinces. Uh, first thing, he wants to know how many people do I have so in 28 BC, there is a census taken. We know for sure that the Roman Empire in 28 BC had about 90 million people. Uh, out of that population, three out of every four Romans lived in an area that was conquered by Rome. So they weren't actually living in the city of Rome. Now, he encouraged self-government. He thought that all of these different cities, all these different provinces should look after their own affairs Augustus ordered that everybody respect local customs and then just pay him the tax money and it would be okay. Now one of the really weird things that kind of grows around Augustus is this idea of the cult of Roma. It's this semi-religion, quasi-religion, it's really weird. But it's going to create this spiritual bond that keeps Rome and the provinces together. Now, when you look at the Hellenistic East, when you look at Greece and those areas, they have a history of worshiping kings. So this isn't that out of place. In Greece, in the eastern part of the empire, they're going to worship Augustus the person. Augustus the person is going to be treated like a god. Shrines are going to be built for him. In the western half of the empire, it's the spirit spirit of Augustus that's worshipped as a god and not the physical person. But either way you look at it, you're either worshipping Augustus the person or Augustus the idea, you're worshipping the emperor. So it came to be that when a Roman prayed for the good health of the emperor, they were actually praying for the Roman Empire. And it's this cult of Roma that's going to keep Rome together for quite a while. 
Now, under Augustus, Rome is going to complete its conquest of Spain. It's going to take more of Gaul. It's going to try to take what is today Germanic territory. And you see there the list of places that Rome controlled. It controlled Austria, Bavaria, Hungary, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania. It's eventually going to go into Britain as well. And all these territories, except for Britain, of course, because it's across the water, they were all linked by roads. And these roads were very well built. The army used them to go from place to place. And there are some cities, some towns in Europe today that are still using these Roman roads. All right, some uh, details here. We got to talk about some rulers to understand Rome. Uh, your first dynasty are the Julio or Julio Claudian. These are going to be the descendants of Julius Caesar. You got Augustus. He reigns for 27 BC to 14 AD. He's Caesar's adopted son. I told you all about what he did already. After Augustus dies, a man named Tiberius is appointed as the heir. And he's kind of a weak ruler. He didn't really want to be emperor, but Augustus chose him, so he couldn't say no. Uh, he wanted the Senate to do everything, but he never gave enough details for the Senate to work. So most of the time when the Senate met, they were trying to figure out, what did Tiberius mean when he told us to do this? Uh, he ends up being uh, kind of a bad emperor. I mean, he doesn't do anything terrible, but he's not great. Uh, he hated being emperor to the point that he gave power to a friend named Lucius Sejanus. And eventually Sejanus tries to betray Tiberius. The betrayal is discovered. Sejanus is executed under Tiberius's order. Uh, Caligula is the next guy. He starts out really well, but in late 37 or early 38 AD, he gets sick to the point that he almost dies. The idea is he probably saw his mortality and, and realized that he was, you know, his time was limited. And when he got better, he turned for lack of better words, evil. Uh, he would kill anybody he saw as a threat after he recovered from his sickness. And he wasted a ton of money building stuff. He wasted a ton of money on himself. And he nearly sent the Roman Empire into bankruptcy. He's gone eventually in 41 AD. And Claudius, who's the best of these early rulers, takes over. He expands the empire. He's going to serve as a judge in trials and be impartial and fair. Uh, he's going to create aqueducts and public works and bring running water to the Romans. And whenever he met in the Senate, he treated the senators like an equal. He sat beside them. He waited his turn to speak. He was very, very polite and proper around them. Eventually, Claudius dies and Nero takes over. Um, Nero, oh, he, there's a long story here that we don't have time for. So let me just uh, kind of summarize. Nero was blamed for setting the city of Rome on fire in 64 AD. We don't know for sure if he did or not. The ancient historian writers, most of them say Nero had a hand in it. One of them says he didn't, and another one says, I don't know, I wasn't there. So there's a real possibility that Nero either set the fire or had somebody set the fire for him. Uh, after the fire was set, he blamed Christians for it, who we'll talk about in a couple of days. And Christians were arrested and executed because of Nero blaming them. Um, what probably happened is either Nero did set the fire or he didn't really try to put it out once the fire began. And he tried to rebuild Rome in his image. He built a bunch of buildings for himself. He built a bunch of buildings that he personally designed. And uh, he also killed his mom. All right, the year of four emperors. This is what happens after Nero dies. In March of 68, the military is so tired of Nero and his inept ruling that they rebel against him. Nero is killed by the army. Uh, this guy named Galba is going to declare himself emperor. Um, and... Galba, he's the governor of Spain, he angers the army by withholding pay, and he adopts a guy as his heir named Lucius. 
Well, this makes the governor of Lusitania or the governor of Portugal angry because he thought he was supposed to be the heir, not the Lucius guy. And he turns around and pays 23 members of the Praetorian Guard to assassinate Galba. So he marches on Rome. He waits for Galba to die. And then he forces the Senate to declare him emperor in January of 69. Vitellius, who's the governor of Lower Germany, he declares himself emperor and starts a coup against um, a guy named Otho, who's the governor of Lusitania. In April, Otho and Vitellius, they meet on the battlefield. Vitellius beats Otho, the governor of Lusitania, and Otho commits suicide because he loses. And most historians say Otho killed himself to try and prevent a civil war from happening. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't stop things. Once Vitellius takes over, uh, another guy named Vespasian, who is in the eastern half of the empire, his legion, his army, declares him emperor, and Vespasian and his army march all the way from Jerusalem to Rome and defeat Vitellius in battle in July of 69. So you've got one year, you've got four different emperors, and things just go crazy. All right, the Flavians. Uh, this is the dynasty that's founded by Vespasian. Last time I taught this class in the spring, somebody asked me, well, why was he called Vespasian? So I added his name. It was officially Titus Flavius Vespasianus, which is where you get Flavians from. Now, the Flavians were kind of ruthless. They were kind of hardcore, but they weren't necessarily bad. And I got a picture of good old Vespasian there. Uh, they... Sta managed to stabilize the empire, but while they were doing that, they put down a bunch of rebellions, including the final Jewish revolt in Jerusalem. And the Jewish people are kicked out of the Holy Land, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is destroyed, and the Jewish people actually don't return to the Holy Land until the 1940s, after World War II. So they're gone for a long time. Uh, at the end, Vespasian gives power to his two sons, and that makes Rome officially a monarchy. And the two sons, one was named Titus and one was named Domitian, not important for us. Uh, Domitian, however, he was assassinated in the year 96. All right, the five good emperors. These are the best five emperors that Rome ever had. Uh, they were part of the Antonine or Antonine dynasty. And you got Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius, Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. Uh, I'm just going to give you one of them as an example. Hadrian is a really good example for everybody. Uh, Hadrian, he was born in Spain, meaning he's not actually from Rome. Uh, he was educated in Rome, though. Uh, he served in the army from a young age. He lived with the soldiers. The soldiers loved and respected him. Uh, his cousin, Trajan, uh, taught him how to be a good emperor. And when Trajan becomes emperor himself... He puts Hadrian in charge of the entire military. Now, once Trajan dies, then Hadrian is going to reorganize the entire government. He's going to make the army this career-based system where um, it becomes noble to be part of the army. Uh, let's see, what else does he do? Um, he go, he's going to organize the civil service. The civil service becomes an equal and respectable alternative to advancing in Roman society. It used to be you had to fight in the army to go up in the ranks. Well, no, under him, civil service is perfectly fine. Now, there are some changes that are going to happen in Roman life as the Roman Empire gets older and older and older. For one, the Roman army is no longer this army of conquest. It's this army of defense. And the composition of the army changes, too. Originally, you had to be a soldier who owned land. They get rid of the land requirement. Then you don't even have to be technically a citizen of Rome. You just have to be part of the Roman Empire. So most of the legionnaires are going to be taken from the, quote, less civilized parts of the empire, meaning the edges, the frontiers. And actual Romans are going to be the officers. Now, what does that mean? Well, the fewer Romans they have in the army, the less they care about Roman tradition or Roman culture. So the army is going to actually change and become less 
loyal to the emperor. Uh, the city of Rome is going to be 750,000 people, and to put that into comparison, Atlantis, inside the perimeter, if you will, it's only 525,000 people. Now you might be saying, I thought it was millions and millions. Well, yes, but most of the millions and millions don't live in the city limits. When you actually look at the city limits of Atlanta, 525,000 people, Rome in 100 AD was bigger than the city of Atlanta. It's crazy. City of Rome had all these beautiful public buildings. They had these great mansions, these residential areas, but then there were slums mixed in. Uh, there was a professional police force. There was a professional fire force, but fire and crime were still big problems. And overall, the streets are narrow. There's a, not a lot of drainage, but the city's clean. There are rules put in place saying you can't just empty human waste in the streets. There were certain places you had to put it, and they did their absolute best to keep it clean. In fact, ancient Rome was cleaner than most European cities up until just recent times. And there was a form of welfare. Uh, Rome could not produce enough food for its population, so it had to import food from Egypt. And every citizen, to try and stop rebellions and revolts, every citizen was given grain, oil, and wine by the emperor. The emperor thought, if I, if I give the people these things, then the people will like me. All right. Uh, Entertainment consisted mostly of gladiator duels and chariot races. Uh, Hadrian, who I mentioned a minute ago, in the year 126, he sponsored a six-day combat festival where 1,800 pairs of gladiators dueled. Now, who were these gladiators? There were criminals, there were slaves, there were prisoners, there were free men who volunteered, there were even women who fought in the pits. And if you died, it usually meant death. If you won, and you won enough, you could get fame, fortune, and riches. Chariot racing was even bigger. Each lap was held in a, an arena or a stadium. Uh, the races were seven laps long, and the seven laps covered about five miles. I've got a link on here that says go to YouTube. If you pull up the actual PowerPoint, the link should work, and it takes you to a clip of the movie Ben-Hur. Ben-Hur is one of my favorite movies of all time, but it's like four hours long, but it's fantastic. It's got Charleston Heston as the, the lead player. But this link I have you set up to go to is the chariot race scene from the movie. It is the most realistic chariot race scene ever filmed. It was filmed in an actual stadium. It was so expensive they could only film it once. And, wait for it, a guy actually dies in the filming of the scene. If that doesn't make you want to watch it, I don't know what does. But uh, moving on, settlements in the provinces. Uh, a lot of the Roman economy is based on agriculture and the farmers in the provinces are the ones who are going to be the backbone of the empire. Now the farmers are given loans from the emperor, the, the interest rate is pretty low. Uh, a lot of these immigrants in these provinces were former uh, soldiers who were told to settle there. Uh, the Roman ideals go with all these former soldiers and all the Roman roads that connect the, the frontiers cities and towns grow up on those roads and trade is going to expand using all of those Roman roads. So places like Antioch, Corinth, uh, Paris is going to become important, Brussels, uh, all of those cities are going to become increasingly important because they're all seen as trade centers. Now all good things must come to an end and before I give you the fall of the Roman Empire, here is your secret word. Secret word for today is cartoon. C-A-R-T-O-O-N. Cartoon. Why is the secret word cartoon? It's because the wrath of the bubble guppies is still continuing. I can't get my child to watch anything else. So cartoon. C-A-R-T-O-O-N. All right, so the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, after the last Antonine, Marcus Aurelius dies 
in 180, he's replaced by his son named Commodus. And Commodus is a really bad leader. It's going to lead to this civil war. Um, people didn't like Commodus. He thought he was a god. He was thought he had godlike powers. He renamed everything after himself. Uh, Commodus had 12 names, and all 12 months of the calendar were named after him. Uh, he renamed the Legionnaires Commodius Ears. Um, the guy was crazy. And eventually he's assassinated. Um, a couple of years later, a guy named Septimus Severus is going to gain control of the empire. He kind of stabilizes things for a little bit. He and a couple of his descendants are serving as emperors, but it only lasts 40 years. From 235 until 284, there are more than 20 emperors, and they all get killed. That is a very, very unlucky job to have. By the time we get to 293, a guy named Diocletian has control, and he's going to divide the emperor empire into four different parts. Eventually, four parts is going to become two parts, and Maxentius and Constantine fight at the Battle of Milvian Bridge for control of the empire. Uh, not to be a spoiler or anything, I hope you've read the Battle of Milvian Bridge, but um, Constantine wins. He's going to convert to Christianity, which we'll talk about later. He goes on to create and build the city of Constantinople, and forever the empire is split. Okay. Now, the last thing for today um, <clears throat> has to do with your research paper. I've gotten some questions on it about what to do, and the first thing I want you to do is find a topic. How do you do that? Well, what have we talked about in this class that's interesting to you? What do you see in the future that is interesting to you? Whatever it is that you find interesting, start reading about it. Use, go to Wikipedia, Google Julius Caesar's name, whoever it is that you choose. Start looking at it. The second thing I want you to do is log into Galileo. Through Blackboard, there is a link to Galileo, and I want you to start looking for sources about your thing, your topic, your person. So for example, let's say that you're interested in Julius Caesar. Go to Galileo, search for Julius Caesar, and just see what you can learn about him. Do that this weekend. It shouldn't take long. You can do it from your phone. You can do it from your computer, wherever it is. Just take maybe an hour this weekend and see what you're interested in and do a little background reading. If you can do that, that will get you started on your research paper and I can give you some more details on Tuesday as far as how to do your research and what sort of sources you can use. All right, until then, have a good weekend. Have a safe 4th of July. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.